Okay, good afternoon. My name is Cedric Cohen Scali. I'm the director of the Busiris Institute, and it's a great pleasure to say a few words of introduction for our second Manfred Lunchtime lecture. Um, this year, we are happy to announce that we expanded the Lunchtime uh, Fellowship to a one-year uh, fellowship. Uh, unfortunately, last year we it was only a short-term fellowship, and Jonathan was uh, granted the fellowship only for uh, three months. And now we are happy that it is a full-year fellowship, and Dr. Ariel Friedan is here uh, and is the next uh, fe Lunchtime Fellow. Um, the fellowship bears the name Lunchtime as a mark of our gratitude for the work of Manfred and Sonia Lunchtime in promoting relationships between Germany and Israel in general and in promoting the development of the University of Haifa in particular. It is a way to express our gratefulness for more than 20 years of dedication of uh, Professor Manfred Lanstein and Sonia Lanstein uh, to the Busiris Institute and the University of Haifa. It is also a way to express our deep gratefulness to the entire team of the Zeit Stiftung in Hamburg and especially to his new director, Professor Hartung. Without uh, Professor Lanstein and Professor Hartung's <coughs> activism, without the long-standing support of the Zeit Stiftung, our institute could not have reached the many successes and achievement it has arrived at uh, the last uh, 20 years. So now I would like to give the microphone for words of um, greetings to Professor uh, Lahnstein, um, and I will after that present our lecture. Well, good morning. Uh, heartfelt greetings from the Zeit Foundation, from your friends in Hamburg, Zeit Stiftung Hamburg, the only friends. We have many friends in Hamburg. We have been here now for five days, my wife Sonia and me, and we have had seemingly unending discussions, which is not astonishing, given the situation you are in and we are all in. I must say, I had a slight expectation that perhaps I would find answers. Uh, we go home, at least I go home, with more questions than I came with. And uh, to some extent it was a difficult experience. But it is always a g great, great event for both of us to be at University of Haifa yesterday uh, when we had the meeting of the Board of Governors, a, an Italian friend came to see me and he said, the world is so terrible. You have been a pillar of this university for so many years. Can you give me, please give me a glimmer, and he meant it seriously, please give me a glimmer of hope. And I said, what? A glimmer of hope? Look around you, you are at the University of Haifa, which uh, well beyond the work of the Institute uh, is a very important example how the world around us here could look differently from what it looks today. Uh, so we go home 
at least we didn't discuss it yet. <laughs> I go home with more questions than answers, but um, you see the young people here, the students, you see the life at the university, you see the intellectual curiosity, you see the, the ideas and plans of the new leadership, because there is the change in presidency and in rectorship, and um, that is much more than a glimmer of hope. So we go home grateful as usual. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Lahnstein. And now we proceed to our lecture. Let me briefly present you Dr. Jonathan Kaplan. Dr. Jonathan Kaplan is an historian of modern uh, German history. His research interests include German-Jewish relations, nationalism, cultural memory, and post-war history. Kaplan completed his undergraduate studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and heard his PhD from the Freie Universität Berlin. His first book on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of German Democratic Republic at the, and the National Socialist Past was published in tw uh, 2022. He has published several articles on post-war German Jewish history, visual history, and Holocaust memory. He is currently uh, working at the Specialized Information Ser Service for Jewish Studies at Goethe University Library Frankfurt am Main. His doctoral project focuses on the interactions between Western Jewish and anti-fascist organization and the government of the German Democratic Republic. For this project, he received the Hilde Robinson Guest Fellowship at the Moses Mendelssohn Center for European Jewish Studies and the Manfred Landstein Fellowship at the Busiris Institute for Research of Contemporary German History and Society at the University of Haifa. From October 2024, he will be a MSCA postdoctoral fellow at the Center for European Studies at the University of Verona, MSCA. It's a very complicated uh, way to say that you receive one of the major uh, fellowship in European uh, wo uh, academic world, which is the Marie Curie Fellowship, and our greatest uh, congratulations. <laughs> and now, um, uh, you. Um, Prof. Uh, Dr. Kaplan will be uh, speaking or addressing the topic between anti-fascist and anti-Zionism is Germany complex relationship with Israel and Zionism. Please, Dr. Kaplan, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Cedric. Uh, Shalom. Uh, this is my first time, my first visit in Israel since the 3rd of October. Uh, so I skipped the whole, uh, the, the peak of the uh, war and the horrible times you have uh, uh, been experiencing. And um, so it's for me, it's also an uh, interesting experience to be here today. So first and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to Cedric, the Butzeris Institute, Haifa University, the Zeitstiftung Butzerius, and of course, Sonia and uh, Manf Professor Manfred Landstein. Um, Thanks to them, I had the opportunity to conduct archival research in Germany uh, as a Manfred Landstein postdoc fellow, uh, Professor Landstein political career, and his dedication to fostering German Jewish and German Israeli uh, dialogues, as well as his commitment to promoting excellence in research at the Butzelis Institute here in Haifa, are extremely important, especially during these difficult times. And I'm very honored to uh, present the second Manfred Landstein lecture here today. In my talk, uh, between anti-fascism and anti-Zionism, East Germany's complex relationship with Israel and Zionism, I will discuss different interpretations that the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, gave to the term Zionism, which, which uh, influenced uh, its uh, political behavior towards the state of Israel. Uh, 
For those who uh, are unfamiliar with the history of the GDR, the German Dem Democratic Republic, was established in 1949 in the Soviet occupation zone parallel to the Federal Republic that was established in the American, British, and French occupation zones in the West that were formed after Germany's defeat in the Second World War. East Germany was part of the Soviet bloc and was politically controlled by the Soviet Union until the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989 and the subsequent reunification of Germany in 1990. Throughout its 40 years of existence, the GDR defined itself as an anti-fascist state, a self-identification that challenged and shaped its confrontation with the German guilt and responsibility for the Nazi crimes, which was developed independently from that of the Federal Republic in the West. When speaking about Zionism in the GDR, this term was used in various contexts. First, as part of the diplomatic, diplomatic relations with Israel, for example, in the context of the negotiation on reparation for Holocaust survivors, the Wiedergutmachungsabkommen, in the context of the Middle East conflict, but also in the context of home affairs and the status of the German Jewish community in the GDR. I see the GDR's relations with Israel and Zionism as an inherent part of its coming to terms with the past, Vergangenheitsbewältigung in German. These definitions are particularly relevant to the ongoing debates surrounding Zionism, anti-Zionism, and anti-Semitism in the wake of the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7, 2023, and the subsequent war in Gaza. Before I go deep into the historical analysis, I would like to start with the following quotes. As Jewish citizens of the German Democratic Republic, we raise our voice in order to solemnly condemn the Israeli aggression against its Arab neighbor states. Despite all terrible lessons from the past, the rulers of Israel found it insufficient to enter into a faithful and unnatural alliance with imperialism, but furthermore, they openly collaborate with the Nazi murderers of the Jewish people with the, with the West German imperialist in Bonn in the closest possible manner. These are quotes from the Declaration of Jewish Citizens in the German Democratic Republic that was published on June 9, 1967 in different East German newspapers during the Six-Day War between Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and Israel. The man who stands behind this publication was East German politician Albert Norden. Norden was head of the Agitation and Propaganda Department in the Central Committee of the Socialist Unity Party, the ruling party of uh, East Germany, SED, in the GDR and an important figure in the GDR foreign policies and international propaganda. Norden's biography is rather unconventional compared to what one might expect for an East German leader. His father was Rabbi Josef Norden, who was until 1935 chief rabbi of the Jewish community in, in Elberfeld, near Wuppertal, who in 1940, 1942 was deported to Theresienstadt, uh, where he died a year later. My talk is divided into two main parts. Both deal with different aspects of East German views on Zionism. The first part presents a biographical analysis of leading Jewish figures in East German diplomacy that provides insights on their conflict with Zionism and the existence of the State of Israel. These are East German Jewish politicians whose biographies represent the generation of German communists who came back to Germany after the <coughs> Second World War in order to establish a better Germany in the Soviet occupation zone. Their life stories and ideological training cannot be separated from German Jewish history of the 20th century. In the second part, I turn to documentation from different East German archives, which deals directly with Zionism. The positions expressed in these documents were formulated by different political players. The East German government, leading functionaries of the ruling party, SED, officials of the Stasi, the Soviet Union, and from the East German Jewish community. My purpose is to show how the GDR defined, viewed, and criticized Zionism, and how, it un and how its understanding of Zionism affected its position towards the State of Israel during the Cold War. The topic is in the center of attention of my new postdoc project on encounters between Jewish anti-fascist organizations in Western countries and the government of the GDR. After the German defeat um, in the Second World War, in the winning allies, the Soviet Union, United States, Great Britain, France, divided Germany into four occupation zones. German communists and anti-fascist fighters who had spent the war years in exile took advantage of this opportunity to return to their homeland. They were politically active in the Communist Party before and during the Third Reich. Their goal was to reconstruct a new moral German state 
founded on Marxist-Leninist principles, anti-fascism, and on the fight against Nazism, drawing from the lessons learned from the, from the atrocities committed by Germany during the World War. Many of these people were of Jewish origin and spent the war years in concentration camps in, or in exile, for instance, in, in the Soviet Union, South and North America, East Asia, or British mandate Palestine. While trying to agree on a solution for uniting Germany, each side of the occupying powers wanted to strengthen uh, its influence and hegemony over the future German states. In 1949, the German Communist Party, supported by the Soviet Union, declared independence and established the German Democratic Republic. On the other side, the Western Allies founded the Federal Republic we know today. In my dissertation, I dealt with different political and historical interpretations of the notion of coming to terms with the past in the work of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the GDR. My first intention was to find, uh, to provide an East German response to the work of the Independent Historical Commission that confirmed the involvement of the Nazi Foreign Ministry in the execution of the final solution for the Jew Jewish problem. One of its revelations was also a known fact after 1945, was that uh, Nazi diplomats who committed war crimes continued their diplomatic work in the West German Foreign Ministry. I wanted to fill the gap in the research and to find the Nazi diplomats of the GDR. However, the social structure of East Germany led to different outcomes. Most of the GDR diplomats, at least in the first years after, after its uh, from, uh, establishment, were of commun communist and socialist background. And yet, the GDR leadership had to integrate people who grew up in the Third Reich and uh, were politically active in Nazi organizations in the new regime, including in the, in the diplomatic service. So in the first part of my research, I revealed biographies of former Nazis who developed diplomatic career in the GDR, members of the NSDAP, Hitler Jugend, or officers in the Wehrmacht. These people are defined in historical research as small Nazis. Another central chapter of my research I dedicated to the work of Jewish politicians in navigating the East German foreign policies, either as members of the ZK, the Central Committee, or diplomats. These individuals, as I have already mentioned, were politically active in the communist and anti-fascist movements before and after the Nazis came to power. In the dissertation, I find some similarities between the official attitude of the GDR state toward former Nazis and Jews. Both were surveilled by the secret police, by the Stasi, as potential political threats to the state. Talking about German Jews in the GDR, one should distinguish between Jewish politicians and the East German official Jewish community. Politicians of Jewish descent in the GDR were not affiliated with the Jewish community and did not publicly acknowledge their personal connection to Jewish heritage in official statements. The people I will mention in my presentation had a decisive role in establishing the new state and more importantly, in representing its anti-fascist ideology as they define it according to their personal experiences as Jews. My purpose is to examine if the East German anti-fascism can be identified separately from Cold War politics and in this case by focusing on GDR official rejection of Zionism and the state of Israel. And now I turn to the diplomats. The biographies I present uh, tell us about the complex relationship of GDR state with uh, its Jewish citizens and highlighting the tension between their individual destinies and their commitment to the ideological stance of the GDR. My aim is to show that these people developed their anti-fascist worldview after 45 and if and how it affected their political activities as Jews in the GDR. Like Norden, which I mentioned already, not all politicians will, I will present are uh, diplomats or officially working for the foreign ministry. However, they represent an important, important officials of the GDR who worked in the field of international relations. One of those is Hermann Axen. He was born in 1916 in Leipzig. Uh, in his youth, he was a member of, the, of different communist organizations. In the last years of the Second World War, he spent in a subcamp of Auschwitz and in Buchenwald. Since 1962, he was head of the International Political Commission at the Politburo of the Central Committee of the SED. And although he was not an official diplomat, he was considered as the architect, architect of the GDR diplomacy. Axen grew up in a non-religious assimilated family. His brother Rudolf were members of the Jewish community in Leipzig, and both left the community and joined the Communist Party. Rudolf was arrested by the police in Dresden in September 33 and was killed during his interrogations. 
in a profile about Hermann Axing in the West German newspaper Die Zeit from, from the 1980s, is described as an important leader of the Communist Party. In other occasions, it is mentioned that he was uh, the secret foreign minister, minister of the GDR or the strategist of the GDR and the most important advisor of the Secretary General. His memoirs were published in, 19, sorry, in 1996 with historian Harald Neubart, who writes about him. Quote, it is difficult to imagine today how the liberation from the concentration camp, from the horse of, of SS barbarism and war, marked for life with a blue number on the arm, must have affected young Hermann. In these memoirs, he talks about his experiences in Nazi Germany and later in the concentration camp. He does not define himself as a Holocaust survivor, but as a, as a Holocaust survivor, but rather as a returnee from a concentration camp or as an anti-fascist, a tireless fighter for peace, and an internationalist. These self-definitions are similar to those of other East German politicians that distance themselves from their Jewish roots. Next example uh, that also shows the contribution of German Jews to memory culture in the, GDR, in the GDR is Friedrich Wolf, who was the first GDR ambassador to Poland. Wolf belonged to the old generation of communists, and already before 1945, he was a known author who wrote successful books like Professor Mamluk and Der Rater Goethe um, that were adapted into films in the GDR and belonged to the cultural coming to terms with the past in East Germany. His son, Konrad, was a famous film director in the GDR, and his other son, Markus, was head of the Foreign Intelligence Division in the Stasi. Another East German diplomat um, whose experiences in exile shaped his post-war political views is Günther Nobel. He was head of the Commerce Delegation of the GDR and head of the department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Before 1945, he was politically active in, in different um, anti-fascist movements, and his father was also a rabbi, Rabbi Israel Nobel, who immigrated to Palestine before the war. Nobel and his wife, Genia, were caught by the Gestapo in 1936, and eventually they escaped Germany and found refuge in Shanghai, together with other German Jewish exiles. In their memoirs from the 1970s, the two excluded themselves from Jewish Zionists and from other and the Jewish middle class they met in Shanghai. They explained their decision to immigrate to Shanghai and not to Palestine like many other German Jews did at the time because, quote, as communists we reject the politics of Zionism, the establishment of a Jewish of a state for the Jews on the cost of the Palestinian people. However, they expressed sympathy towards other others who could go back to who could not go back to Germany, and I quote, the land where their human dignity was literally trampled underfoot and many relatives and friends were murdered. Nobel began his career as an economic political advisor in the SED, and he was forced to step down from his public positions due to political reasons, officially because he had relatives in non-socialist countries. The real reasons for his uh, resignation um, he did not mention in his, in his CV, uh, the widespread dismissal of Jewish officials from their political roles in the GDR at the time. It was not until 1957 that he was able to resume his political activities according to various documents I found in the Stasi archive. The investigation uh, into his background began already in the 1950s, shortly after his uh, return to Germany. Like almost every investigation of the Stasi, uh, its agent collected information about the political and personal experiences, including the time in the concentration camps and in exile. His Jewish roots are also mentioned. In one instance, um, he's referred as a half Jew, uh, where another as a full Jew. The Stasi investigation did not bring any direct conclusion or feasible consequences, mainly because Nobel's political dedication was approved by his co-workers and neighbors. One can ask what kind of impact uh, Nobel's Jewish background had on his political and diplomatic activities. Like his fellow Jewish politician, he was not member of the Jewish community in the GDR. Only after the German reunification in the 1990s, uh, he became a member of the Jewish Cultural Association in Berlin. A Jewish journal uh, from the time interprets Nobel's attitude toward Judaism and explains that like other of his generation who were raised in a religious environment, he chose to reject Jewish traditions. 
As a member of the Jewish Cultural Association, he was also involved in political activities, such as the organization of anti-fascist demonstrations against the NPD, the National Democratic Party, which is a neo-Nazi party in Germany. The political change, the Wende, in the 1980s and 1980s allowed Nobel to somehow reconcile with his personal history. The next story I will skip and we'll turn to Kurt Stillman. Kurt Stillman's experiences in exile are similar to those of other individuals I discuss here. However, he developed distinctive approaches for processing the Nazi past. In the 1960s, sorry, in 1960, Stimmel became an international expert in the Ministry of Commerce, and later he was Secretary General of the GDR Commission to UNESCO, as well as Delegate in India, Yugoslavia, and Finland. About Kurt's story, we, we learn from his brother, uh, Günther Stimmel, who himself was an important official in the GDR. In his autobiography, Günther writes about his, about his brother and about their shared memories from Berlin and um, the time they both spent in exile in Palestine. He describes Kurt as a committed communist and pacifist. Gunther, who was active in Zionist circles in Berlin, successfully obtained certificates for himself and his brother to immigrate to Palestine. Kurt lived in a kibbutz and later moved to Ben Shemen. And in Palestine, his political views shifted dram dramatically. Gunther writes in, that his brother said, in, other, in any other country, I would be a communist, but not here. It was only until the 1950s that he realized he did not fit into the political circumstances, circumstances in Israel, and perhaps because he missed his old homeland, Kurt Stillman returned to Germany, to East Germany. My research has shown that the begin in the beginning of um, 1953, shortly after his return to Germany, Stimmel worked for the Stasi. Back then, he was affiliated to the German Commerce Compensation, and he was uh, recruited as a secret informant. His Jewish um, background was the main reason for this recruitment. The Stasi agent wrote in his uh, reports that is, in his department there were many other Jewish colleagues in high-ranking positions. The Stasi agent wrote that a um, quote a person of Jewish origin as a person of Jewish origin, um, Stillman has the opportunity to provide us with valuable clues. An example for such clues, Stillman, Stillman was able to provide after a meeting with a suspicious Jewish Israeli citizen. The Stasi collect personal information about uh, about Stillman and so on. In his CV that he provided to the Stasi. He gives details about his past. Among other, he mentioned the political engage engagement in Weimar Republic and in Palestine and Israel, where he, he was a member of the Communist Party of Israel. Um, yeah, uh, we jump a few years forward to the end of the 1980s when the GDR of political approach toward the Jewish community, German Jewish history, and the cultural memory of the Holocaust and towards Israel had changed dramatically. The GDR had initiated uh, the reconstruction of synagogue, synagogues, celebrated Jewish life, and conducted public discussions on the German responsibility for the Holocaust. Shortly before the fall of the Berlin Wall, Stillman's reports for the Stasi focused on explicit Jewish issues that worried him at the time. At first, he criticized the East German government's preparations uh, for the 50th anniversary for the Kristallnacht. He wrote that different events focused too much on religious Judaism, although, quote, the pogrom affected Jews whether they were religious, atheist, or working class. It must be stated that Israeli racism of the ruling circles of the Israeli government is not to be confused with Judaism. Unfortunately, this happens unintentionally and carelessly in some publications." End quote. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the German-born Israeli journalist Inge Deutschkorn from Mariv visited East Berlin and met Kurt Stillman and his wife Rachel, uh, who moved with him to Palestine, from Palestine to the GDR. Back then, Rachel Stillman was a Hebrew teacher at the university in Berlin, in East Berlin, of course, and she said to Deutschkorn that she presenting the, st the student with the real face of Israel, and that in her thoughts, she was always in Israel. In this uncertain time, before the reunification took place, she expressed her worries from, from neo-Nazism and, and, and anti-Semitism in the future unified Germany. Kurt said that despite all these difficulties, East Germany was his home. 
In these interviews, they, all, they also talked about the early days in the GDR and that they had to wait until 1959 to feel welcomed in the East German society. As, diploma, as diplomats, they said they represented the GDR with great pride. After highlighting the personal and biographical aspects of German Jewish life in the GDR, we'd like to st take a step back and discuss the broader context of the GDR instrumental understanding of Zionism and its direct impact on its political stance toward the State of Israel. In 1997, the German historian Angelika Tim published an important monography which is considered to be one of the first studies on East German East German-Israeli relations or non-relations. Hammer Zirkel David Stern. Tim is an expert in Israeli and Middle East history and began her career already in the GDR. Although she criticized the East German hostile political attitude towards Israel and its an clear anti-Israeli positions, uh, Tim comes to the conclusion that the GDR was not an anti-Semitic state. Other scholars like Michel Wolfson and Jeffrey Herf, on the other side, suggest that every critic on Israel on behalf of the GDR was anti-Semitic. Wolfson, for instance, defines East German Jewish public figures who cooperated with the regime in propaganda actions against Israel as useful idiots. If I may, I turn back to one of these useful idiots, Albert Norden, with whom I open my talk. And as I've already mentioned, he was a lead figure in the GDR, and his, fam his family history was known uh, for other East German leaders, and he always also had a family in um, Israel. Already during the early years after the end of the war, before the GDR and Israel were founded, we can recognize some hints for the future attitude of the East German leadership in the Soviet occupation zone. Throughout the years, they demonstrated, they demonstrated a hesitant acceptance of the existence of a Jewish state. We can see that in interviews given by leading East German politicians to Israeli newspaper, for instance, Albert Norden, uh, in which they could turn directly to Israeli audience. In a series of interviews uh, Norden gave to Kol Ha'am, the newspaper of the Israeli Communist Party, he stressed the GDR position towards the confrontation, confrontation with the Nazi past, focusing on the West German failed denazification process and the success, alleged success of this in the GDR. He distinguished between followers of the Nazi regime and war criminals, and I quote, every German who was a Nazi, function, Nazi functionary, but not a war criminal, was given the opportunity to participate in social rehabilitation. Northern emphasized that in the GDR, the high-ranking political positions were only occupied by anti-fascists who were committed to democratic values. Interestingly, his own Jewish roots are not mentioned in these uh, interviews, presumably because the readers already knew he was Jewish. His anti-Israeli and anti-Zionist opinions were criticized in other newspapers, uh, more bourgeois newspapers like Mariv, especially when he expressed his views on the Middle East conflict. <laughs> Personal ob observation on his own family are quite uncommon. In a research written by Peter Lust in 1966, in which he reports on his visits in Western and Eastern Germany, he also interviewed Norden. In, his, in, in this interview, he asked direct questions on Norden personal life, if he feels affinity toward Jewish religion at all, and what does he think about Israel. This may be the only occasion when Norden spoke openly and said, yes, I am of Jewish origin. He also talks about his father, uh, Rabbi Joseph Norden, and I quote, often I forget this fact because in our state, a person ethnicity has lost its significance. I am a citizen of this state, and that is all I desire. I am not religious. I have no particular interest in the Jewish religion, but I feel familiar with all people of Jewish origin not because it's part of my biography, but because I like people. About Israel, he repeats some of the stereotypes one could hear from a other socialist or East German politician. Um, Israel is an imperialist force and is controlled by the US. He also added, Norden also added, that he does not approve the state of Israel, but he does like its citizens.
the Slansky trial and other anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic wave mm. and, and um, um, process, uh, crimi not criminal, but uh, yeah, um, trials, <laughs> waves in, in, in the Eastern Bloc, in the Eastern Bloc, ended this short honeymoon. As part of a political cleansing of the leadership in the GDR, many Jews and many Jewish politicians were removed from their positions. During this time, many Jews also decided to escape the GDR and to move to the Federal Republic. Only after Stalin's death in 1953 and the destalinization of the Eastern Bloc, Jews in the GDR were able to take part in public lives, public activities, public life again. In my research, I came across some interesting material, including correspondence from the 1950s of the East German Secret Service, the Stasi, that deals specifically with Zionism. I will now present some examples that represent the East German leadership intellectual and practical confrontation with Zionism. In a letter uh, titled Discussions on Zionists, sent directly to Secretary Milka from uh, January 15, 53, Inspector Harnish of the Dresden district writes about the disappearance of an East German citizen, Leon Löwenkopf. Löwenkopf was co-founder of the Vereinigung der Verfolgten des Nazi Regimes, VVN. It was the association of the persecutees uh, of the Nazi regime and the first chairman of the Jewish community in post-war Dresden. In the same folder where I found this letter, I also found another fascinating document with the title Material on Zionism with some remarkable insights on the East German historical understanding of Jewish history. This document begins with a practical definition of Zionism. Zionism is the movement within Judaism that aims to restore an independent Jewish state. The following provides an overview of Jewish history from biblical times to modern days with explicit concentration on the stories of Abraham, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the founding fathers of Judaism. For the Stasi agents, agents who had no experience in biblical texts, the documents also explain that Yaakov was also called Israel. The document uh, continues, and I quote, despite their political annihilation after the expulsion from Eretz Israel, the Jews did not perish like their fellow tribesmen in the Northern Kingdom, but remained a people without a homeland, held together by the law of Moses and the promises of the prophets who held out the, pro uh, the prospect of the Messiah who would lead them back to the promised land and establish a glorious kingdom. This leads the readers to a broader explanation of what is Zionism. Zionism is therefore the expectation of one day returning to the old homeland of Palestine, becoming a people again and assuming world domination. This Zionism, as strange as it may sound, is popular in wide circles in, of Christianity, despite the old persecutions and pogroms. These different historical descriptions are the basis for the definition of modern Zionism in this Stasi document. I quote, as a result of increased persecution of Jews in former Russia and Poland, uh, the Jewish community tried to find home in Palestine for the refugees and the oppressed. However, those who were sent to Palestine usually did not think about labor or work, but haggled and then returned to Europe. Land speculation flourished in particular when demand drove up the price of land. The following paragraph, uh, paragraphs include uh, short biographies of several uh, Zionist figures like Herzl, Chaim Weizmann, and Ben-Gurion, as well as overview of an overview, uh, sorry, as well as an overview on milestones in Zionist history, like the Zionist World Congress or Balfour Declaration. Here we can find some references to the role of antisemitism in the development of modern Zionism for the immigration waves to Palestine. And of course, the role of the capitalist who supported the Jews and the Zionists is not ignored. Quote, American presidents saw the Jews as their protégé. Uh, this answer for the question, uh, what is Zionism, from year 1953, I find fascinating as they place Zionism not as a new historical phenomenon of the late 19th century, but rather, but rather as a legitimate historical desire of the Jewish people to build a homeland in Eretz Israel. 
The years after 1953 until the end of the 1960s I consider as the peak in relationship between G the GDR, Israel and Jews in other countries. Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem was for the GDR an opportunity to show the world its commitment and as a, um, an anti-fascist German state. During these years, the GDR produced several publications on the incriminated Nazi past of West German public figures. As part of these uh, efforts, East German politicians, among them also Jews, reached out to Jewish organizations and individuals in the West as part of their campaign against the Federal Republic. Walter Ulbricht, the, the uh, head of the East German state, visited to Cairo in 1965 the outcomes of the Six-Day War and the resulting cri critical attitude of the Soviet Union towards the situation in the Middle East also changed the political approach of the GDR towards Israel. And here are some headlines from Neues Deutschland, the newspaper of the GDR from the Six-Day War. You can read that Israel, begin, Israel begins aggression against Arab countries, sanctions against the aggressor, and so on. The contradiction between such statements, together with the East German rejection to tie diplomatic relations uh, with Israel on the one side, on the one hand, and the GDR self-definition as a leading force in the anti-fascist anti fight, on the other hand, did not allow the development of fruitful and reliable relations between Jews and East Germans. In the 1970s, following the Six-Day War and the new geopolitical situation in the Middle East, the Soviet Union um, led an aggressive international anti-Zionist and sometimes anti-Israel campaign. The tone intensify, intensified after the Yom Kippur War, some headlines, heavy attacks of Israel on Egypt, uh, Egypt, Syria and Lebanon, protests against Tel Aviv's violence and so on. The UN resolution that determined that Zionism was a form of racism and racial discrimination was the peak of the anti-Israel international campaigns of the 70s. As archival material shows, the resolution concerned various GDR authorities. A booklet from year 1965, uh, 75, sorry, titled Zionism as a Tool of Imperialism asks, asks and answers some questions concerning the rule and nature of Zionism. Most of its content was translated from Soviet sources. The booklet defined Zionism as, quote, an ideology that is hostile to the interest of peoples, including the true interest of the people of Israel. Here we can find some interesting um, um, statements like Zionism is the theory and practice of aggression against the Arab states or the Zionists have done much to camouflage their anti-democratic activities or in reality the Zionists do not consider anti-Semitism to be evil. For them it is a blessing as the spiritual father of Zionism Herzl wrote about. Or the racist ideas of Zionism which echo the racial theory of the Nazis find their logical conclusion in Israel. This text includes some clear anti-Semitic biases, and yet I interpret, it, I interpret it, this not as a complete rejection of Zionism, but as criticism, and quite harsh one, for the way in which Zionism was implemented and developed in Israel. The Jewish community in the GDR tried to find a way to oppose or to uh, contradict the anti-Israeli and anti-Zionist argumentation of their government uh, in order to convince that Zionism and Israel were not that horrible. Peter Kirchner, head of the uh, Jewish community in Berlin, in East Berlin, wrote in November 75 to Minister of uh, church, church Affairs Hans Zeigewasser, and I quote, in the debates, uh, phrase combinations are used such as all Jews are Zionists, Zionism is fascism, Zionism is racism, Zionism is anti-Semitism, Zionism is reverse anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, condemnation of Zionism as a form of racism is a retroactive justification of German fascism, and so on. 
Kirchner states that due to um, lack of clear definitions, there is a danger in misunderstanding what Zionism is. Here, he offers a historical background of Zionism, as we've seen earlier, uh, Zionism and anti-Semitism. And interestingly, for people that should have known what anti-Semitism is, as Jews and communists were victims of the same persecution. Um, Kirchner employs fairly factual and historical arguments for rejecting Zionism as a, from a Jewish perspective. The main argument would be Jews are not a nation, but a religious community. He also add that, our, that there are different political streams inside the Zionist movement and mentions that the results of the Six Day War were rightfully criticized in Israel. Furthermore, he explained the term anti-Zionism and warns of the danger that it could be, for, that it could be similar to anti-Semitism. And I quote, the emphasis that the Jewish bourgeoisie is particularly reactionary is dangerous insofar as, a, as the highlighting of the Jewish aspect strongly resembles a demonization that was previously abused as Jewish finance. Here he actually offers a separation between Zionism and Judaism. Now I come to my conclusion. Throughout the years, the GDR changed its political uh, politics towards Israel. Although the two states never established official diplomatic relations, the GDR leadership expressed, at least in the first years after 45, some tolerance toward the Jewish state, especially in regard to the fight against Nazi criminals. Nonetheless, it should also be mentioned that Israel itself was hesitant in approaching East Germany. For instance, when, when um, a GDR official and diplomats approached uh, Israeli de delegates abroad, this I found in, the, in some uh, documents in the archives of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. The stories of Jewish individuals I uh, present today show a complex and contradictory attitude of people who had to balance between their ideological beliefs and their day-to-day -day politics. They tell us a twofold story. One of the communist anti-fascist exile and the other is the German Jewish exiles, who in many cases, in many terms, can be considered as Holocaust survivors. The Jewish politicians uh, developed an anti-fascist version of Jewish life in the GDR separate from the religious community. They express an ideological, historical, and personal conflict between the Jewish identity and loyalty to the anti-fascist ideological settings in the GDR. As anti-fascists, they had the world, a moral function in the development of Jewish life in post-war Germany, but also had an important role in the development of new understandings of anti-fascism from a Jewish perspective. I find their official action of Zionism an inward part of their anti-fascist and socialist worldviews. Some of these people had relatives in Israel, and they, had, and, and they understood quite good the politics in the Middle East. The solution for peace in the Middle East did not mean the end of the Jewish existence in Israel, but gave an option for coexistence between Palestinians and Jews in one state. Their biographies embody tensions that existed in communist and left-wing circles in Israel itself, as well as in other Jewish communities abroad. Um, yeah. The Middle East conflict and the geopolitical interests of the Soviet Union made it impossible for the GDR in Israel to develop friendly relationships. What can we learn from the history of the GDR anti-Israeli politics in order to have a better understanding of current anti-Israeli campaigns? Many participants uh, in anti-Israeli demonstrations uh, in the United States and elsewhere see the foundation of Israel as a historical mistake and a crime against the Palestinian people. As we all know, the fear from the next Holocaust is part of the Israeli DNA. For many Israelis, every criticism on Israelis perceives anti-Semitism. The arguments of pro-Palestinians today are similar to those we have heard during the Cold War. Then and now, Jews took and take part in the campaigns against Israel. It's, it's interesting to have another look in the, um, into the uh, declaration of Jewish citizens in the 
GDR that I opened my talk with. Although the people who signed this declaration express harsh criticisms on Israel, they do not deny its right to exist, nor support the establishment of a state, of a Palestinian state from the river to the sea. The motivation for the anti-Zionist attitude of Jews in the GDR is based on their conviction in communist ide ideology, as well as in their, on their personal experiences before, during, during, and after the Second World War, whether in exile or in concentration camps. This I find as an important point when considering GDR anti-Zionism and anti-fascism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Herr Landstein, you want to offer a, a comments or we open to the floor? Two remarks. The, the first one is a purely personal one. You mentioned Friedrich Wolf. Yeah. And you mentioned Markus Wolf. Yeah. Uh, who was the great spy, ma spy master of uh, the GDR, of international renown. He abducted my secretary. He turned around, not directly, but via one of his specialists. He turned around my secretary and made her a spy for the GDR, uh, but not, not too dramatic, but rather dramatic. <laughs> I met him in the 90s, Markus Wolf, when he published his memoirs. The memoirs were uh, published by the company I had been working with. So uh, I, I um, presided over a lecture given by Markus Wolf it was very lively in Berlin, as you can imagine. And afterwards, we were sitting at a lunch table together. Uh, I did not attack him directly. He did not mention it at all. But then during luncheon, he said, of course, I know who you are. And yes, I abducted your secretary. But I can console you, your secretary is the only one which has married her spy who had led her and uh, even was the the pater, uh, the, the godfather of, 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 of their kid. And then we started discussing and his urgent wish, his urgent wish was to visit Israel. Can't you help me to visit Israel? Before I die I want to see Israel. <laughs> he, because he had tried to come to the country and the Israel authorities, for good reasons, had, had um, uh, refused him. Um, I did not help him. It serves him right. Mm -hmm. The general remark is a very <laughs> brief one. You, you, you mentioned, for instance, the Slansky process. The Slansky process and, and other events, uh, for me, has always been a sign of the unbelievably big influence the Soviet Union had on the GDR. Not only in the formal sense that we all know, but in the way the, the ruling Communist Party, the SAD, uh, developed their policy, always until the very end, always in conjunction, on tr conjunction with the uh, Soviet Union. So many of these things you could so correctly and so bravely and finally <laughs> mentioned uh, have to see in this context as well. Thank you very much. Jutta? <coughs> thank you, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I have uh, two very quick, short, 15 minutes e each question. Um, uh, uh, unrelated. First, um, a very common narrative in Israel about the relations with, let's say, Eastern the communist bloc is that the watershed moment is 1954, following the Korea, the Korea uh, crisis, right? So around, uh, until 1954, the relations, I mean, it's not clear where Israel stands vis-a-vis -vis this kind of, uh, of uh, two kind of deformation of kind of Eastern versus Western bloc. And from 1954 onwards, it's clear, and then, you know, when Israel makes its decision to go, well, I don't know, together with the US or whatever, uh, which, is, which, is, which is actually, uh, uh, which is actually uh, strange. Um, uh, when, when you think about Israeli politics at the time and this, the strength of the uh, socialist and communist parties here. 
when Israel makes this decision, of course, the communist world uh, started to be anti-Israel. Do you find a correlation to this kind of a narrative of uh, this 1954 uh, watershed moment uh, in the papers that you uh, that you uh, investigated from the uh, from the GDL side? So that's the first question. The second question is a little bit more complicated. Uh, my my problem is this. Uh, I'm, I'm specifically talking about Jewish, the Jewish perspective, Jew, German Jews who are in Eastern Germany and talk about Zionism the way they do. Why is that important? Right? Uh, why should I believe them? Uh, given the type of, or why would I even focus on that? Given the type of regime that the Jedel was, given the fact that they know that the Stasi is listening, Jews as a minority, as a persecuted minority, uh, within this context tend to, uh, tend usually, in other contexts, we know that they will tend to develop this kind of uh, Marano kind of attitude. There's what they say outwards, which has nothing to do with what they really think. And there's those, you know, the candlelights that they light in the basement, right? So, using this Marano metaphor, which is something that, uh, that um, uh, Agatha taught us, right? So they tend to develop this kind of Marano attitude. And then whatever they say, uh, when they know that the Stasi is listening, it's not important. I mean, I mean, the guy who says, you know, of course I enjoy uh, talking with Jews because I like people. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, why do you focus on this kind of explicit statement, uh, political statement for Jews when you know that they have no significance at all, right? Just to put it, uh, to put it very radically. Um. In regard to your first question about 1954, I, for that I would need to look at the Israeli uh, uh, documents, which are at the moment a bit impossible to get. In the, uh, yeah, it's what? Still close? Uh, yeah, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, I I had some. Uh, I, I didn't have the chance to get some before it was closed, but uh, I need to check if there is something about it. But uh, yeah, it is interesting, and I think I would separate between the Eastern Bloc in Germany and East Germany because it was a totally different story um, in my eyes, at least. Uh, concerning your second question, why uh, why um, reading each statement of a uh, of an East German politician because he's when he talked when he talks to the to the public he lies anyways uh, everything he says is is not true um, but these lies are interesting for example I give an, an example from the from the Nazi diplomats that I uh, read about in their they write a really uh, long CVs like stories of their life story and they write yeah I came to the uh, re-education center in uh, Moscow and now I believe uh, now I'm a communist so yeah. And maybe it has to do with your question, but I think that they talk about Zionism as a euphemism for Judaism in many cases. So this is why I find it quite interesting because this uh, Leuvenkopf, yeah, information about Zionism. It's not information about Zionism. It's information. It's a, it's information about Jews. Yeah. I hope it's, uh, Silvana. Uh, third question about yeah. Uh, there was any role or significance? of uh, Ernst Bloch as uh, an intellectual who was uh, dear to the GDR regime on the one side, on the second side, uh, quite uh, close or, or sympathetic with Zionism, or at least not against him. I, I didn't quite understand the question. Is there any mention of ah uh, no I, I, yeah, of Ernst Bloch, Bloch I didn't find any mentioning of him no uh, I was looking at quite specific uh, when I look at the in the Stasi archive I gave them names and they gave me specific I could not like go to the shelf and look whatever I want <laughs> and uh, unfortunately um, no I didn't find anything about the archive yeah it is uh, but also in the um, Bundesarchiv uh, it's uh, yeah I didn't see anything about it. Yeah, but I can never look. <laughs> Mark? Uh, yeah, thank you. Really, really interesting uh, talk. Uh, I really appreciated the fact that you uh, try to actually, you know, listen to what these uh, reports and these politicians have to say and talk to analyze and to see which, you know, in what sense it echoes anti-Semitic stereotypes and where it, it actually doesn't. 
and you know it, it, you don't just go into the usual discussion of whether this country was anti-Semitic uh, or not. But I want to still give you a, a one pushback on on, the, on one aspect. I mean, um, the very fact that Zionism is such a prominent concept in these discussions is not uh, self-evident uh, because there is a country which is Israel, and you know. There are different ways to talk about Israel, and there, are, and there were many critics of Israel that didn't really focus on the, you know, problem with Zionism as an ideology, or that presented it as the as the underlying uh, problem with whatever Israel is consequently doing. Mm -hmm. And despite all the all of the nuances and all the good context that you mentioned, there is a, this sort of Stalinist uh, impulse of like. Uh, saying Zionism as, so that you don't need to ex express your anti-Semitism uh, vocally. So I wonder if the very fact that this is the focus of the discussion, you know, in the Stasi or in the press, uh, this in itself uh, wreaks suspicious and it deserves maybe a, a more sort of, a, a sort of a ungenerous interpretation. Yeah, that's interesting. It's also, I ask myself also what, how can I define anti-Zionism at all? Or Zionism, which is also a big question, what Zionism is. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you, uh, but uh, it is interesting. Uh, yeah. I have an, if there is no other question, I have a, a, a question for you. Uh, first, thank you. Um, well, you, you began and you ended with uh, the contemporary discussions uh, about uh, uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. Uh, what I, if I'm if I'm trying to connect uh, what you present to to the problem that we are facing nowadays I would think about the uh, desire especially, especially the role of certain uh, Jews and their uh, desire to to fit, to please, to be uh, instrumental in a certain broader historical structure and uh, here I think that you have something to compare with mm -hmm. especially when you say that nowadays we, we tend to consider a communism as a you know you, you compare uh, Zionism with communism which is which is which is funny because nowadays nowadays it works, but uh, in the in the in the early 20th century and until the 60s, communism was a, was a very big issue and a very big structure. Zionism is, is something very very small. So there is here, I think, the tension, and also if we take into consideration nowadays the issues of, that are linked to post-colonialism, there is also this idea that there is a big historical structure and a big historical narrative uh, behind that. And if you can be instrumental, if you can, be, uh, if you can play a role in it, whether if, it, if it's a lie or if but I don't know. Here, I, I think that you you have something you could say a little bit more mm. uh, about uh, the the role of uh, the Jews uh, in uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, and a broader structure uh, that is uh, communism. I think mm. uh, here you. And basically, I, uh, my my impression, when uh, upon hearing your your talk, is in both cases you have the you have the feeling that there is a clear current in history. Uh, that history is going to a certain uh, evolution, 
and therefore you can justify yourself and you can justify your uh, even self uh, hate uh, by fitting to this mm. larger, uh, larger framework. So you think the Jews that are participating in the anti-Israeli campaigns today are useful idiots used by the BDS movement? I don't know. I didn't use this. Uh, I didn't use this uh, this formula, mm. but I I'm sure I'm surely thinking that behind uh, these protests there is a clear uh, understanding that there were there are phases in history so there was a phase before the colonialism then there was co colonialism then there was the early post-colonial phase and now we are at a new phases which is the phase of decolonization mm. and uh, here i believe that a lot of jews think that they have a role to play there mm. uh, and well that was my yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about uh, Jews that are trying to fit themselves into the system uh, at least in the GDR uh, I think everyone tried to fit itself into the system but the Jews of course they had a special role in that because they were the victims and uh, but I mentioned it with Norton, for example, they didn't see themselves as Jews. So I was asking another occasion, if they don't define themselves as Jews, how can you do that? But, But the Stasi look at them as Jews. Exactly. And uh, they knew it uh, yeah, yeah, quite well, right. I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, how can you call them German Jews if they are not defining themselves as Jews? I mean, this, this is the question I was asked, uh, which is uh, true. I mean, I'm not seeing myself as a Jew, so why do you call me a Jew? But, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's part of the biography, so you cannot ignore it. Okay. I have a personal question, but you don't have to answer. Do you feel any uh, uh, personally anti-Zionist feelings? <laughs> Uh, what is Zionism and what is anti-Zionism? Any other question? Okay, so we thank you so much. Thank you.